Before we get started, if you're interested in learning about the broader response to COVID-19 here on the campus of the Hudson Alpha Institute for Biotechnology, see the show notes or stay tuned for the graphic at the end of the video for information about our upcoming virtual benefit. But now, let's talk about immunity. It's an important issue as we deal with antibodies, who has them, who doesn't, but there's a whole set that's often completely left out. So in this episode of Shareable Science Beyond the Blog, we're gonna talk about the A's, B's, and T's of COVID-19 immunity. Welcome to Shareable Science. Science you can share. The immune system is incredibly complex beautifully complex. There are multiple layers of immune response that help protect us against foreign invaders. I'm just gonna skim across the surface and touch on just a handful of pieces. So for any immunologists that are watching, I apologize in advance. Hopefully I don't make you grimace too much. For the rest of us, there are some key points that I wanna get across. We spend a lot of time talking about antibodies. That's our A in the A, Bs, and Ts. Antibodies are small molecules that recognize and bind to a foreign invader. We're focused on the antibodies that bind and neutralize the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the virus that causes COVID-19. Those antibodies are produced by a specialized type of cell called a plasma cell. You can think of them as antibody factories. And plasma cells are a subgroup of a broader category of immune cells called B cells. There are multiple different types of B cells. The plasma cells are what we're most focused on. But in addition to B cells, there's a whole other category that you might not have heard much about. Those are called your T cells. And T cells provide an additional arm of your immune response. We're gonna focus on two types, helper T cells and killer T cells. Killer T cells, as their name implies, actually destroy other cells. They break them apart. They um, directly or indirectly cause their complete destruction. In this case, they're attacking our own cells that have been infected with the virus. And they identify that in very specific ways by signals that infected cells give off. So a killer T cell identifies an infected cell and sends a series of signals and messages that actually causes the cell to be destroyed. Helper T cells, as their name implies, are support cells. So they actually benefit both B cells and T cells to allow them to mature and to do their job effectively. All right, so that's what happens in the moment of an infection. But both B and T cells have a subset of cells, a small percentage of cells that are called memory cells, memory B cells and memory T cells. And these hang out in circulation in the bloodstream. They may actually um, find themselves just kind of encapsulated, uh, waiting in specific tissues like the lungs or the gut for weeks or months or maybe even years. And they provide the immune system's remembrance system that, hey, I've seen a certain virus or a certain bacteria before so that if you're reinfected, your body can quickly say, oh, I know you and I know how to attack you. And quickly, these memory B and T cells divide and produce more antibody producing plasma cells or more killer T cells to really quickly take down the infection before you become sick. So it stops reinfection in its tracks. This is an important part of the system of um, immunity once we've had a vaccine, for example. So the neutralizing antibodies and the memory cells are an important part of what the vaccine hopes to trigger so that if we do get infected, we've already got all the key pieces in place. All right, that's more content than we normally cover on these as a background, but I want you to have that understanding now as we transition to what do we know about B and T cell responses in SARS-CoV-2. So, We've only recently begun gathering enough data to really give us our first glimpse at, at something coherent. And I'm gonna actually show you data from three preprints that have all been published within the last few weeks. The references for those are here. 
Remember, a preprint hasn't gone through the critical process of peer review, so it has not been reviewed by scientists that were not associated with the original work. All that to say, these preprints may undergo significant change or they may uncover important pieces that the researchers initially missed. So take what I'm talking about with a grain of salt. All right, so the data suggests that antibodies to the SARS-CoV-2 virus appear about 10 to 15 days after the onset of symptoms. They also appear for asymptomatic individuals, but the timing isn't necessarily fully understood. Here's where it gets challenging. The antibody response, the amount of antibody that's produced and the time in which it's produced isn't consistent from person to person. So you might see a curve that looks like this, where you're measuring the amount of antibody and these are neutralizing antibodies, the antibodies that specifically bind to the virus and neutralize it, prevent it from infecting cells. That level goes up, it plateaus, and then after a certain period of time, it seems to drop off. In some individuals, there's a much stronger response, so they're producing many more neutralizing antibodies. Some people have a relatively weak response, and in some cases, that response actually drops off to not even being detectable after a certain window of time. And some people don't seem to show any antibody response. It could be that they just don't make antibodies, or it could be that the research teams didn't catch it at the right time. They didn't run the tests in the brief window when the antibodies were present. Regardless, this is a cautionary tale because it suggests that not every person is going to make a significant amount of neutralizing antibodies and maintain that over a long window of time. The implication of this is still an open question. We need more data to better understand this. A separate paper also looked at individuals that had been hospitalized and people that had mild or asymptomatic cases of COVID-19 and looked in this case at both the antibody response and the T cell response. And they found that all the individuals who were infected produced a T cell response. So there was an immune response, even among the individuals that didn't seem to show any antibodies, which would have been this category in the previous studies. They also found that memory T cells were present. These are those cells that will be long lived in the immune system and those memory cells were specific for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Okay, so how do we interpret this in light of what we know and what we don't know about immunity, both after an infection and as we think about vaccination? Here's some key things we need to know or that we don't still understand. We don't know what level of neutralizing antibodies will confer protection against reinfection. Do you have to have this many neutralizing antibodies? Will lower levels work? Can it be a tiny fraction of neutralizing antibodies? Until we understand that question, we don't know how to interpret these curves. And we also don't know what happens more than three months out. Does this continue to drop or does it begin to plateau? What role do T cell responses confer in immunity? We've put a lot of focus on antibody responses, but if you can mount a T cell response, even in the absence of antibodies, does that confer protection against reinfection? What should we be testing and when? Currently, when we talk about a serological test, we're looking at the presence of antibodies to say, have you been infected in the past? Well, depending on this data, and depending on when we're testing, you may have been infected and produced antibodies, but maybe you're not producing them anymore, or maybe you never produced them. Do we need to begin adding T cell responses to our testing panels to try to identify immunity? And again, we need more data that stretches out beyond the three month window of most of these studies. Do you have immunity for a short period of time? Or do you have immunity for years? Some coronaviruses only have months in terms of immunity. Other coronaviruses, we have protection for years. Where does SARS-CoV-2 fall in that mix? So, like nearly everything else we've talked about with this virus, there are more questions than answers. But we're beginning to get an understanding of how both sides of our immune response play a role in dealing with this virus. I hope you find this useful. 
It's worth thinking about when you see these studies that talk about antibody levels dropping or antibody levels staying the same. If you know other people who would benefit from this, please share this video with them. Thank you for watching. I look forward to seeing you for our next episode of Shareable Science Beyond the Blog. Take care.